we continue Aleister Crowley's The Diary of a Drug Fiend, Book 3, Purgatorio. By starting Chapter 7, Love Under Will. I began to laugh, despite myself. Well, I said, puffing at my cigar, I do really wish you'd let me know what this is all about. Has Lloyd George resigned? No, said Big Lion. It's just you. What about me? I retorted. Why, your success, of course, said Sister Cypress. Something, of course, quite obvious to them was hidden from my dull understanding. I turn on Basil. Point blank. What success, I said. It's true I do see my way through a formula that's been bothering me. But I don't see how you know about it. Do Hermes and Dionysus comprise a knowledge of the differential calculus in their attainments? It's very simple, said the big lion. It involves a knowledge of nothing but the law and the law after all, is nothing but the plainest common sense. Do you remember my asking you before Tiffin what was your true will? Yes, I said, I do. And I told you then, and I tell you again now, that I haven't the time to think about things like that. The fact, he retorted, was quite enough to assure me that you had discovered it. Look here, I said. You're a good sort, and all that. But you really are a bit queer, and half the time I don't know what you were driving at. Can't you put it in plain English? With all the pleasure in life, he returned, just look at the facts for a moment. Fact one. Your maternal grandfather is a mechanical genius. Fact two. From your earliest childhood, subjects of this sort have exercised the strongest fascination for you. Fact three, whenever you get off those subjects, you are unhappy, unsuccessful, and get into various kinds of mess. Fact four, the moment the war gives you your opportunity, you throw up medicine and go back to engineering. Fact five, you graduate reluctantly from the bench to the pilot seat. And your squad commander himself sees that it's a case of a square peg and a round hole. Fact six. As soon as the armistice throws you on your beam ends, you get busy again with the idea of the helicopter. Fact seven. You are swept off your feet by coming into a fortune and immediately go astray with drugs. Clear evidence that you have missed your road. Fact 8. As soon as your mind is cleansed by the boredom of Telepilus, of all its artificial ideas, it returns to its natural bent. The idea of the helicopter comes back with such a rush that you let your breakfast get cold. You don't know your wife, and she brings it, and you can talk about nothing else. For the first time in your life, your self-consciousness is obliterated. You even start to explain your ideas to me, though I know nothing of whatever of the subject. It doesn't require any particular genius to see that you have discovered your true will, and that accounts for the champagne and applause at lunch. I scratched my head still hardly hardly con I scratched my head, still hardly comprehending, but one clause in the big lion's roar had struck me with appalling force. I looked around the circle of faces. Yes, I've discovered my will, all right. I said, I know now what I'm f good for. I understand why I came to this silly planet. I'm an engineer. But you said, my wife. That doesn't fit in at all. Where is she? 
Well, you know, returned McLean with a grin. You mustn't imagine me to be a cold storage warehouse for other people's wives. If I might hazard a guess, how are your wife's discovered what her own will is and has gone off to do it? Oh, damnation, said I. Here you know, I say, I can't allow that sort of thing. The big lion turned his sternest gaze upon me. Now, Sir Peter, he said, incisively, pull yourself together. You've only just discovered your own will, and you naturally want to be, let alone to do it. And yet, at the very first opportunity, you butt in and want to interfere with your own wife doing hers. Let me tell you, point blank, that it's none of your business what she chooses to do. Haven't you seen enough harm come from people meddling with other people's business? Why hang it, man, on your first duty to your wife is to protect her. Another of your paradoxes, I growled. As a matter of fact, I was torn between the two attitudes. Lou had been an ideal companion in debauchery. Of all sorts, a woman like that was bound to be the ruin of a hard-working engineer. At the same time, I was madly in love with her, especially after seeing her for the first time that morning. And she belonged to me. It was only too clear to me what he meant by saying she had discovered her true will. She had shown that plainly enough when she had begged him to take her away. He had simply worked one of his devilish tricks on me and got rid of me, as he thought, by getting me absorbed in my helicopter. I was to be the complacent husband and allow my wife to go off with another man right under my nose while I was busy with my calculations. I was to be the Mari complacent, was I. Well, the fiend was ingenious, but he had calculated wrong for once. I got up and deliberately slapped him in the face. Before breakfast, he said to Sister Athena, we shall require pistols for two and coffee for one. But while we were waiting for the fatal rendezvous, he added, turning to me with one of his inscrutable grins. I must continue to keep my oath, as it happens. One of the brethren here is himself a mechanic. That little house on the headland, he pointed to as he spoke, it's fitted up as a fairly complete workshop. We might stroll down together and see you started. There will probably be a lot of things that you need which we haven't got, and you can make a list of them and we'll telegraph Lala to buy them in London and bring them down here. She is coming in three days' time. I will also ask her to stop in Paris for one of those nice iron wreaths with enameled flowers to put on my nameless grave. The man, nonchalant, made me suddenly furiously ashamed of myself. I had to spit out between my teeth that he was an unutterable scoundrel. That's right, Sir Peter, retorted the big lion. Reassure yourself by all means. The unspeakable lemus is the classical expression, and it is customary to give a slight shudder, but perhaps a genius like yourself is justified in inventing new terms of abuse. I was disconcerted abominably, by the attitude of the audience, whose faces were fixed in broad grins, with the exception of Dionysus, who came straight up to me and said, Sana, a bitch, and hit me in the eye. <laughs> okay. um, if you shot my bid lion, he added, I'll shoot you. The entire company broke into screams of uncontrollable laughter. Lamas rose with assumed indignation and observed ferociously. Is this your idea of doing your wills, you wasters? Did you come to this planet 
to turn the most serious subjects into mockery, you ought all to be weeping, considering that within 24 hours you will have to bury your beloved big lion, R, our esteemed guest, who has endeared himself to all of us by his unconscious humor. Come along, Sir Peter, and he slipped his arm through mine. We have no time to waste with these footlers. As to Unlimited Blue, he began to sing. Has anyone seen my Mary? Has anyone seen my Jane? She went right out in her stocking feet into the pelting, pouring rain. If anyone sees my Mary, he'll oblige, I declare. If he'll send her back in a packing case, this side up with care. We were already far down the slope, striding like giants. From above came a confused chorus of shouts and laughter. One has to be an athlete to run downhill, arm in arm with Big Lion. He didn't seem to mind the cactus, and when we came to a ditch, it had to be jumped. And when the path took a little turn uphill, he used our momentum to take us over the crest like a switchback. It made me positively drunk. Physical alarm was combined with physical exhilaration. I was sweating like a pig. My sandals slipped on the hard, dry grass. My bare legs were torn by brambles, gorse, and cactus. I kept on slipping, but he always turned the slip into a leap. We never checked our career till we pulled up at the door of the house on the headland. He let go of me suddenly. I flopped and lay on my back, panting for breath. He was absolutely cool. He had not turned a hair. He stood watching me while he pulled out his pipe, filled it, and lit it. Never waste time on the way to work, he observed in a tone which I had only... I can only describe as pseudo sanctimonious. Do you find yourself sufficiently recovered? He added in mock anxiety to resume the vertical position which distinguishes the human species from other mammals. I believe the observation is due to Virgil, he continued. There was a twinkle in his eye which warned me that he had another surprise in store for me. I had begun to realize that he took a schoolboyish delight in pulling people's legs. He seemed to enjoy leading one on, putting one in a false position, and making a mystery out of the most commonplace circumstances. It was extremely idiotic and extremely annoying, but at the same time one had to admit that the result of his method was to add a sort of spice to life. I remembered a remark of Maisie Jacobs. Never dull where Lamas is, the effects had been of an ordinary and insignificant character, and yet he had given a value to each one. He made life taste like it does when one is using heroin and cocaine, yet he did it without actual extravagance. I could understand how it was that he had his unique reputation for leading a fantastic life, and yet how no one could put a finger on any particular exploit as extraordinary in itself. I picked myself slowly together, and after removing a few thorns from my bare legs, was sufficiently master of myself to say, So this is the workshop? Once again, Sir Peter, replied Lamas. Your intuition has proved itself infallible, and once again, your incomparable gift of expression has couched the facts in a tertiary of a grammatic form, which Julius Caesar and Marshall might make, uh, might despair of editing. He opened the door of the house, repeating his old formula. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Till that moment, I had found the phrase, by turns ridiculous, annoying, or tedious. It had completely lost those attributes. The dry bones lived. I thrilled to the marrow as he uttered it. A soft, sweet voice, strangely familiar, answered him out of the vast, dim room. Dim for the blinding sunlight of the open air was in, unable wholly to illuminate the interior to my contracted pupils. And I don't know if the last program is going to finish this book or not.